Okay, let's just have a look at... Uh, we'll come back to some of the good stuff out of uh, last night in a moment, but let's have a look at the ugly stuff, and that is the campaign against Tony Abbott mm. in Warringah. I think this is a, a bit of a first for Australian politics, the fact that you'd have so many powerful organisations lined up to get rid of someone. I mean, uh, make no mistake, there's no push on here to think Zali Stegall is going to uh, be the new political uh, 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 guiding light of this country. They're not trying to form a new government. The whole point here was trying to pick uh, the person they saw as the arch-conservative and take him out. Get up the Greens, Labor, the Vote Tony Out group. Uh, really nasty. As I pointed out on Sky last night, uh, the Vote Tony Out group actually preferenced Fraser Anning's party ahead of Tony Abbott. That's how principled they were. That's how low they would go just to get rid of Tony Abbott. I think we've got some vision here of some of the carrying on at the polling booths where where people opposed to Abbott and, and get up, uh, people were tearing down posters and the like of it. There was even physical violence involved. Um, this is just really uh, unprecedented oh. stuff. Well, we've seen bits of this, but to be focused on one person to get rid of them is new, isn't it, Kerry? Oh, look, I thought what they, the campaign they ran against Tony was absolutely outrageous. Look, I know that Tony um, has his detractors across the community and people are entitled to express a view. Absolutely. But this be, the, the personal and nastiness of it all, you know, the fact that, that people who were working for him were being, were being harassed at polling booths. And, I, look, I don't know, I can't believe that she had that many volunteers because I, I, I pre-polled in town because I was, for a whole lot of reasons, I was entitled to pre-poll, let me say. I pre-polled in town and she had two volunteers at the pre-poll in the city. Mm. So, I mean, there weren't, there weren't that many people who would any other candidate, so she had an enormous number of volunteers. I'm told she had... I'll be fascinated to see when her electoral return comes in mm. to see how much money she had. But, you know, I mean... The lack of respect for Tony, and as I said, love him or hate him, he has served this country for a very long time. The only other time I've seen that sort of angst or directed and, you know, bitterness directed was actually towards Bronwyn Bishop. Yes, they were true. very nasty yeah. about Bronwyn Bishop as well and, you know, the people who were, who were so mm. excited when she lost her pre-selection and the vitriol that was directed to her was, I think... Not quite as bad as Tony. I mean, they worked to get rid of a sitting member, but as a person, they were pretty vitriolic about um, well, Bromwood as well. Well, they sent a, you know, a parcel of, uh, of faeces to Tony oh, Abbott's office. They had posters around the electorate with the C word over him. Yeah. They were intimidating a lot of his people. Uh, they, they were just focused on getting rid of him. I know his family was... Uh, was put off balance by, by, by some of the intimidation. And here's what Tony Abbott had to say when I caught up to him after his concession speech last night. There is absolutely no doubt that it was very personal. It was often nasty and occasionally it was vile. Um, and look, it was successful. But on the other hand, however much disappointment there might be about the result in Moringa, there should be great satisfaction about what seems to be the national result. Yeah, Tony Abbott, I've known him for a long while. I first met him when he was a backbencher back in the mid-90s and I'm a great admirer of his. I, don't, I haven't agreed with everything he's done. No. Uh, in, in, in fact, we've had our disagreements, but I'm a, a great admirer for his, uh, his advocacy, his uh, strength mm -hmm. of character to follow through on the issues he really believes in and the fact that he just works hard at, at his job and believes uh, he's such a conviction politician. It's a very sad mm -hmm. end, John, to to his career, although I, the point I'd like you to get to your, your comment on is I think if the Liberals had lost, it might have been very important for them to have Tony Abbott in Parliament to, to make sure that the Conservative uh, side of the party was defended. Yeah. But I think with him out, it actually works very much in Scott Morrison's favour. There's no Turnbull, there's no Abbott. He has uh, uh, unquestioned authority and he can try and remake the party and just make sure, uh, as I think he's demonstrated, that it won't lose its conservative instincts. Well, look, really since the uh, Republican referendum in 1999, Tony Abbott has been the sort of de facto leader of the conservative movement in this country. I'm not talking factually, although within the party and within the party organisation, he's always been a big player. So the conservative movement now really is... There is a, there is a sense of uh, vacuum there. Scott Morrison it has proven that you can win elections by being right in the middle, and that's what he campaigned on. Uh, he, I don't believe he's like Tony Abbott. He's not a conviction conservative. So it's going to be, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how this uh, vacuum does get filled. It might take some time. Look, there was a swing, obviously a big swing against him, but it hasn't really been reported much across the whole North Shore of Sydney, Kerry's old uh, stomping ground, 
there was about a 5% swing in seats like Bradfield, McKellar, North Sydney. But, very interestingly, in the western suburbs, Parramatta, Banks and these places, even Parramatta that we didn't win, we actually came quite close to it. I think what it is is the largest number of new migrants that we have had in the last 20 years has been upper-middle-class Chinese and upper-middle-class Indians. And they come to this country with quite conservative values. And, and, and the, the Labor Party has always assumed, well, migrants are going to vote for us. Well, I think there's a big switch going on right now. These people, they are classic Liberal voters. They're pro-family, they're pro-business, they're anti-tax. They just want to get a mortgage and pay it off. And so they are mm. natural Liberal voters and they are starting to come our way big time. Yeah, the where, where, you, where, you, where you've lost votes, though, is some of these climate issues are in the wealthier uh, electorates where people see climate action as a, as, as a virtue signal and they can afford the cost. And, and Tony Abbott certainly mentioned that in his concession speech uh, last night. Mm -hmm. Well, um... Where climate change is a moral issue, we Liberals do it tough. But where climate change is an economic issue, as the result tonight shows, we do very, very well. But can I just say that I think the climate change issue will need to be resolved in this parliament. There needs to be, you know, the, the coalition has, has a plan. Um, I don't think it's been particularly well articulated, but they keep talking about their plan. But let me say that the they coalition cannot afford to go to the next election without this being bedded down. And hey, it's pretty easy, isn't it? It's pretty yeah. easy. Haven't, it's yeah. pretty easy. And that is, you, 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 you are committed, the country is currently committed to the Paris yep. targets. Stick with it. It doesn't matter how you get there. It's the targets that matter. Stick to those targets. And if Labor have got any brains at all, they'll come back from their ridiculous extra targets to Paris. Did, did, then there's no argument. I, um, it's just the mechanism of I, how you deliver. But it's still the mechanism which is going to be... which will cause some debate. And the problem for us, and I absolutely agree with your analysis and your point about our losing votes within those, you know, more traditional areas, wealthier areas, because we need to make sure we bring those people back as well as retain the people in the western yeah. suburbs. So we need to get that issue resolved and, you know, Just at this stage... Have a discussion. Don't be frightened of it, obviously. No. How many, and and how stick many, to your guns. How many coalition politicians have dared to even mention, apart from Tony Abbott, have dared to even mention that what we do won't change the global oh, yeah. climate? You but, know, but, Bill Shorten's out there but, pretending Chris, you can vote for them and change the temperature. Yeah, Gemma? Chris, that, that, that's one part of the equation and it's an important part of the equation, but... But to Kerry's point, it's really important that, you know, the, the, the Coalition can't just say, well, it's not going to do anything. They have to present something. They have to come with a solution that is palatable to those Conservatives who are concerned about climate change but don't want to get on the, on the crazy train with the far left, you know. The greatest own goal of this campaign, in my view, was... Um, Bob Brown's caravan of fools up to Queensland. Yeah. I mean, God bless the man for that, for that, you know, that ex excursion of vanity yeah. that played right into the hands of the coalition, but rightly so, because if ever there was an, um, a physical demonstration of just how disconnected the far left is to the, to the lives of everyday Australians who don't have the luxury of toying um, with the virtue signalling signaling, signaling rather around climate change, there it was. That was but it. The it sure side, was. I'm yeah, going to have to get to a break. It started, it started off with yeah. Bob and Adani. <laughs> no, Michelle Landry actually made that point today. She said, thank you, Bob Brown, you gave me my ma majority. There you go. Yes, yeah, it started off as Bob and Adani and it finished up like Thelma and Louise. We better take a break or they're <laughs> going to get very cranky at me. See you on the other side. <laughs> Back with the panel, Gemma Tognini, Kerry Chikorosky and John Ruddick. Uh, let's talk about... Um, now, let's start, start with Get Up. We were just finished up on the, the campaign against uh, Tony Abbott. One of the things I actually pointed out on this show, going back about two months or so ago, was that wouldn't it be funny, you know, if... The ..they put all their energy, the left, into taking out Tony Abbott mm. and forgot to actually get around and win the marginal seats. <laughs> it seems to be exactly what they've done. They're so focused emotionally and logistically in getting their enemy... Uh, that they forgot about the whole game of elections, and that is to win the crucial seats, the marginal seats. And Barnaby Joyce certainly didn't miss that point last night. The resources get up, put into there. Sucked in, fellas. You wait. You... <laughs> you, we're 
went, went for the sucker trap again, didn't you? To put all your resources into a seat, you weren't going to win, and so you burned up your resources in other seats you could have, just like you did here last time. Anyway, thank you very much, Get Up, for being completely and utterly dopey. <laughs> so, I love it. But the Nats did well, so the, uh, the sort of uh, unencumbered return of uh, Barnaby to the leadership <laughs> might not happen. Yeah, I don't think... I think Michael McCormack is going to be safe. But it's interesting. I, I do think the point about them missing, you know, not taking their eye off the prize... I was talking to people in Queensland about the campaign against Peter Dutton about two weeks ago, and they were saying, you know, what these get-up people aren't realising is Queenslanders do not like to be told by outsiders what to do. Dudes in orange T-shirts oh, don't know what to do. They, and they said, absolutely. Because, you know, and these are people close to the campaign, not in the campaign, but nearby, and they were saying, we're getting people ringing us saying... Who who the, who the hell do these people think they are? You know, if they want to campaign against Peter, that's fine. But get locals to do it. Not all these, you know, mm. Johnny come lately is coming up from them. You know, because nothing exists below that border and we have a lot of people in Queensland. Well, look, I, th I think Advance Australia deserves a lot of credit. Now, they've got a much smaller budget. These were meant to be the conservative version of Get Up. Now, what the best, the, the best thing they did was is that they brought Get Up to the attention of mainstream Australians. Yeah. People had heard about it a little bit beforehand in the bubble. I think most people in Australia now have heard about Get Up and they think it's a bit weird. And they've seen some of these very um, you know, uh, outrageous behaviours. And did you see that one where there's almost like a religious chant, we will win, we will win? They'll go, you know, and so I think Advance Australia, if they look, I know they wanted to help Tony Abbott, but they, they did a very good job in telling Australians about Get Up and now we've got an eye on them. Now, we were talking about uh, ScoMo going back uh, early in the campaign and um, I was talking about how I think Australians were actually getting to know him in the campaign. Right? I think that's one of the things that worked in his favour. We saw a lot of him and they were getting to know him because, sure, he's been around a long while and he was a successful immigration minister and he had his stint as treasurer. But it's not the same, is it? When you're the leader and prime minister mm. to boot, people want to know more about you. They get to meet his wife, Jenny, and the children and know about the sharks and all that. And uh, I just think it worked really well for him. So he almost starts off next week as a new Prime Minister because, uh, yeah. because he's been endorsed by the public, he comes in with his own authority and uh, he's got a real chance to remake this government and put his stamp on the job. And here's how he started doing that in his speech last night. It has been those Australians who have worked hard every day. They have their dreams, they have their aspirations. To get a job, to get an apprenticeship, to start a business, to meet someone amazing, <laughs> to start a family, to buy a home, to work hard and provide the best you can for your kids, to save for your retirement and to ensure that when you're in your retirement that you can enjoy it because you've worked hard for it. Yeah. These are the quiet Australians who have won a great victory tonight. Kerry, this is spot on. This is what the Liberal Party is all about. This is just ScoMo's suburban version of Robert Menzies' Forgotten mm. People and Lifters and Leaners. Uh, I was approached by a lady... ..today who said to me, you know, I'm so excited that um, the Prime Minister won. I am a widow. I don't have anyone to look after me in my old age, but I've managed to put enough money away to have my investment property and I buy shares. And she said, he talks to me. He yep. knows what I'm trying mm. to do. Whereas Bill Shorten, she said... And she said, Bill Shorten wants to take all that away from me. And I've worked really hard all my life to get all these things. I don't want to be a burden to the community. I don't want to be on the pension. Yep. I want to be able to look mm. after myself. And that is what the Prime Minister, not only did he tap into it, he understands that. And Indeed. that's what I think people underestimated in him. He understands Australians. In indeed, I'd, I'd go further than that. It, yeah, because what he said there is, is not just what the Liberal Party's about, it's actually what Australians are exactly. about. Exactly. And if the Agreed. ALP state totally executive, uh, of federal executive are watching, that's what the ALP needs to re-embrace. They did under Bob Hawke and Paul Keating, understand all that aspirational Australia and seek to service it. Now they tend to mock all that and play to the sort of crazy uh, green vegan set, don't they, uh, Gemma? That's... That's got to be the path yeah. forward for Labor. But anyway, uh, well, Scott Morrison's got a fantastic opportunity just to claim that ground and really make something of it. 
Do you know, I was talking to a few people yesterday evening and I think I might have mentioned it to you on your program when Scott Morrison did his first leadership breakfast in Western Australia, not the debate, but he came over and he spoke to, you know, six, seven hundred people in a ballroom over here a couple of months ago and to a person, people left that event going, didn't realise he had that level of substance, hadn't really seen him on his feet one-on-one -on -one before and... You know, I remember remarking, if that's the Scott Morrison that people will get to see, then he can win this election because he was so impressive, so relatable and, and really was across his brief but also understood all of those things. And, and I remember we were talking last week, Chris, about the difference between, say, for example, the McGowan government in Western Australia, which is very much old Labor, sensible, approaching debt, attacking debt, all of that kind of thing. You don't see a skerrick of that woke garbage that gets peddled around Victoria, for example, over here. It, it's a very different Labor Party, in my view, that's governing Western Australia that, for example, is governing... Victoria, and, and that counts. That really does count. Yeah, I think it's important. Now, uh, uh, John, uh, interesting point here. Uh, Paul Kelly in The Australian, I thought, wrote very perceptively on the weekend that if Bill Shorten had won, uh, uh, he, this was when it was still in the balance, he was saying if Bill Shorten wins, uh, the expectations are enormous that he'd set himself. You know, he was going to change the climate, for crying out loud, <laughs> as well as, you know, uh, uh, as well as lower prices and get Indigenous recognition and a republic. I mean, it was, it was a ridiculous uh, over-promising from Bill Shorten. Scott Morrison has got the opposite advantage. He hasn't promised a lot. Uh, so it's the old, it's the old adage of uh, under-promise and over-deliver. Totally. OK, so I'm halfway through writing this book at the moment, which is the history of every leadership spill on the non-Labor side of politics from 1901 up until last year. Now, the fascinating thing about Scott Morrison, now we're now in a new era in the Liberal Party, because there's never really been a leader of the Liberal Party since Robert Menzies that, A, has never had a leadership contender in the party room, and, B, there's now no mechanism to, to replace the leader. So Scott Morrison has got an, a free run. He's got, he's got a demoralised opposition. He, his party room's all under control. So the big question now is, Scott Morrison, why do you want to be the Prime Minister? <laughs> what I fear, and I hope I'm wrong, I, you know, we'll give you a few months, but I fear he wants to be the Prime Minister so he can be the Prime Minister. Now... I hope he proves me wrong. But what is the agenda? What now? I, I you're sounding like you're sounding like some lefty on the ABC who's looking for the vision thing. Well, you know, I, isn't 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 uh, getting uh, no, the economy course. growing and and well, uh, people yeah, into work no, and no, no, the, no. and the budget under control and our borders secure uh, and uh, our energy system uh, into alignment? Isn't this what we want governments to do? The rest we can look after ourselves? Well, OK, yeah. well, what about reducing the size of government? Well, this would be What, good. what about, uh, you know, uh, deregulation? What about serious tax reform? Now, I'm sorry. I'm so now, look, it turned out under the yeah, circumstances... You know, we expect more economic reform, and he has, uh, he has set a, a, a limit on the taxation revenue and he is promising yeah. to shrink the size of government. But I agree well. there's, plenty of, but this, there's plenty of scope for economic reform, Kerry. So I am prepared to have a bet with you, John, that we're... I mean, you, your criticism, I think, could have been made about the former Prime Minister who, you know, the one who clearly wanted to be Prime Minister for the sake of being Prime Minister and then had no basic um, convictions or directions about what he wanted to do in government. I've known Scott for too long and Scott's agenda is very clear. Scott is all the things you're talking about. He wants to make sure that we have you know, government which is focused on, on the community, not focused on itself. He wants to make sure that the burden on the community in terms of things like taxation is lower so that people can actually, keep, mm. as he keeps saying, keep more in his pocket, next, you know, in their pocket and go and earn more and spend more and employ more people. And he wants to make sure that there is a safety net. He wants to make sure that yeah. people are encouraged. As he's, Look, he said it on the day that he announced the election. He said, I want to be, you know, I want to be there for people... People who have a go, we need to make sure they can have that go. You know, give we, them the support. Kerry, yeah. I hope you win the bet. I very much hope you... Look, let's, I, let's have a bet. Let's he, make a bet. Let's, he's let's, got months... He, oh, yeah, let, let's see. He, he, yeah. It's, he, he's got the opportunity now. He has so got this let's, let's see what he happens. He's got a wonderful opportunity. And I get the sense he's not going to waste it. Uh, certainly his speech last night suggested that uh, he yeah. was going to get cracking. Yeah. We better take a break. When we come back the other side, we'll have a look at the other side. How are Labor going to fare from here on in? Maudlin it all is over at the ABC this morning. It's like JFK K got shot, actually. But no, it was just that the government survived. I want to have a look, uh, just have a look at this little exchange and uh, we'll see what the panel makes of it afterwards. The coalition went extremely negative. I think the lesson is that negative works. I'm, I apologise to our viewers that I, I have this to declare, but I think it works. 
whether it should work, well, morally, I have a different view. Well, I, I would rather that it did not work. Yeah, me too. I think uh, reporting on big ideas in, in national politics, you don't want negative to work, but I think the evidence is in from this campaign that it did work. Mm. Something that'll shape the next campaign. I mean, give me a break, Gemma. It's negative to point out that perhaps uh, Australians uh, might be hit by $387 billion worth of new taxes. It's negative to point out that perhaps more than doubling our renewable energy target and almost doubling our emissions targets might actually just, you know, um, uh, train wreck the, through the economy. I mean, honestly, they... Because it's the coalition, they're supposed to be hands off Labor's grand ideas. Well, it was. It's an extraordinary example of sort of you know thoughts and prayers slash everybody needs a hug, isn't it? I mean, let's just not <laughs> forget here, Chris, that that this um, opposition, that opposition, went into this election thumbing its nose at the Australian people saying, we don't have to tell you what our climate policy is going to cost. You just have to trust us. You just have to sort of, you know, lie back and think of England because it's not going to hurt a bit. That's <laughs> well, actually, outrageous. It is it's outrageous. outrageous. And this is the way and the ABC and the left media spin it somehow. Now, of course, the... Uh, the, the coalition attacked Labor's plan. Of course they did. They needed to. It was an outrageous plan. But on Gemma's point, uh, not answering critical questions about the cost of their grand plans, have a look at uh, how Bill Shorten failed to answer that throughout the campaign. They ask you what your policies are going to cost, and until now we don't have an answer. Do you have an answer? Because That is such a dumb question to say, what does it cost without looking at the cost of inaction? You can't have a debate about climate change without talking about the cost of inaction. This is a fundamentally dishonest debate. It's not you or the people asking the questions, it's what you're being... What the government's saying, it is so dishonest. You all recognise a scare campaign when you see one. There is no one mythical figure. The point about it is that we either tackle climate change or we don't. And the problem with answering your question is simply this. Your question makes no allowance for the impact of climate change. This issue about give us one number, I don't think that's possible to do. What we need to do is understand that if you want to stop polluting the environment, you do have to spend some money. Cheap as they carry over at the ABC, they can't understand why uh, Bill Shorten wasn't just catapulted into the lodge with those <laughs> sorts of answers. Well, and I, you know, the point is that we are entitled to ask what cop policies cost because at the end of the day, it is the community the, and the business community and others who are going to have to pay it. And so to be, uh, to be sent, asked on blind faith just to accept it is a bit much. But the other thing is, what I don't understand is if you're putting... And look, and this may be the lesson out of this, forget about the negative stuff. If you are putting out an agenda like that, you need to be able to justify it, but you can also expect that it will be attacked for a yeah. whole lot of reasons and you need to be able to respond to those attacks. And, and I it think should be. Well, oh, absolutely. Journalists, guess what? It should be interrogated, a policy like yeah. that. And what, you think the yeah. Liberal Party is just going to say, oh, no, we really think those yeah. are fabulous bring, bring policies on, yeah. and we're going to, we'll bring endorse on, everything you've said? Bring on some more taxes no, and windmills. So. Bring it on. Now, John, quickly, we're running out of time, but who's going to lead the Labor Party from here on in? Will it be the socialist left member of an inner Western Sydney electorate or the socialist left member of an inner Western... <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, look, uh, I think it's a no-brainer. It should be Anthony Albanese, and I believe it will be Anthony Albanese. He won the membership vote uh, six years sure ago. Sure he did, he but he's not 61%. a woman. He's not a woman. Surely uh, they have well, to go with a woman. and uh, They say that's nah, the most important thing. I think they're going to th wake up to themselves and stop being so woke. Albo is a bit like <laughs> Hawk. He's very likeable. Look, Tanya Plibersek was too connected with this failed campaign. I think she's out. Chris Bowen, same thing. Uh, look, I, I would look. I, 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 Albanese will win the, uh, the the membership vote yet again. And look, look. I know he's always been connected with the left of the Labor Party. Okay, he's been a big factional boss. He has given a couple of speeches in the last year or two, and he got in trouble off Bill Shorten for it, saying the Labor Party needs to have stronger relations with business. I like the sound of that. I do have to cut you off. We are out of time, but you're right. Albo uh, connects well with people and he's more pragmatic than his factional uh, allegiances would suggest. Thanks very much for joining us.